So we are in a series as we're going through the book of Romans, and I just want to take a moment and do a quick recap. Um, one of the things I say is as you get far enough into a series, it gets harder and harder to do a recap, um, especially when you're going through a book of the Bible. So I'm just going to try to give you enough information that if you are a guest or new to this study, that you can feel like, okay, I, I get the context of what we're talking about. But I would encourage you, if anything we say like piques your interest, all of our messages you can find on our website or on our YouTube page. You can watch them for free. And I encourage you to go back and to engage the series because because what Paul does, the, the author of the book of Romans, which is what we're studying, what Paul does is he gives a truth and then he layers it and he builds on it. So over the last many weeks, he's been building toward where we are today. And where Paul began, and this is the way that I paraphrase it, is Paul began his letter that he wrote to the church in Rome by explaining that for those who want to be in a relationship with God is that they have to trust God. And, and honestly, it's something I say every single week, and I would say it this way, is at the end of this series, if you remember nothing else, I want you to remember this truth, that if you want to be in a relationship with God, you have to trust him. Uh, Paul worded it a little bit differently, but this is how he worded it in Romans 1, verses 17. He said, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written. And then here's the line, the righteous shall live by faith. Now I wanna pause. Last week, many of you pointed out that my shoes match that writing, okay? <laughs> The fact that that enters any of your heads just means you guys are strange. But I had probably 10 different people message me and just say, your shoes match it. So I wore them again this week just to acknowledge, yes, I know my shoes match the screen, okay? Woo! Can we all move on now from that? All right. But Paul says the righteous, and that means those in right standing with God, they're going to live by faith. They're going to live by trusting in God. And so Paul then transitions and starts to acknowledge this truth that the, the righteous who are in a relationship with God, God's gonna lead them toward life, but they have a choice of whether or not they're, they're going to obey him in faith or they can reject God and distrust him and walk toward death or destruction. And so Paul just kind of layers this truth over and over that we have a choice. We can trust God, walk toward life. We can distrust God and walk toward destruction. But then Paul acknowledges something that we looked at last week. That in the middle of this choice that we have are the standards of God, and the choice to follow God is not as simple as us just making a choice to do it. What I mean by that is we don't look at the standards of God and then just go, okay, I'm going to obey this one, this one, this one. I don't really agree with this one, and so I'm going to walk this way sometimes and this way sometimes. What Paul acknowledges, the complete standard of God, none of us can actually do it on our own. None of us can meet that standard. Paul actually says it from his own personal testimony, which I think we all agree with. He goes, I actually want to honor all of those things. Those, that's what I want to do. But what I find myself doing is actually disobeying those rules. And the very things I set in my heart that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself continuing to do. How many of you can relate with Paul? It's like, I want to do good, I do bad. I don't want to do bad, I do bad. And Paul's like, that's the tension of our lives. And, and so we looked at it last week. So why did God give us a standard that we could never meet? Well, first is God wanted us to understand a spiritual reality. That sin, disobedience with God, is not something simply that we do, but it's actually a spiritual force that goes against us in our lives and changes our desires and our thought processes to make it impossible on our own to follow God in obedience. But the second reason that God gave us a standard that we could never meet it's for us to understand our desperate need for a savior. We can't do it on our own. We need God to help us. And so where we're going to pick up this week is as Paul builds on this truth, he's going to explain to us the one who's going to help us to be able to follow the commands of God. And who Paul is going to talk about is the Holy Spirit. And I don't have time this morning to explain all of who the Holy Spirit is, but I'll tell you this, the Holy Spirit is God. And, and there's a truth about our God that's really hard for our brains to get around, and that's that our God is one. He's one God, but he exists in three persons. There's God the Father. There's God the Son, who became flesh in the person of Jesus. And there's God the Holy Spirit. And, and if your mind's like, ah, that doesn't make any sense, just join the club, okay? Because it's a transcendent idea that we can't fully understand because we don't exist in that way. But God is dynamic enough that he is one and he exists and reveals himself in three persons to us. And what Paul is going to explain is the third person of the Godhead of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And he is, hear me now, he is the difference between success and failure. 
that if you want to honor God in your life, if you want to experience the full life that God offers you, the only choice you have is to follow the Holy Spirit. If you try any other way, you will fail. If you want God to bless your marriage, you have to follow the Holy Spirit. If you want God to bless your family, you have to follow the Holy Spirit. If you want him to bless your employment, if you want him to bless, bless your individual life, your relationships, your friendships, your witness to the world in any area in your life, hear me, friends, the difference between success and failure is always going to be the Holy Spirit. And so we have a choice. Are we going to pursue the Holy Spirit? Are we going to open ourselves up to his leading and his conviction in our life? And this is where Paul is going to begin and so today I'm going to give you, I'm going to walk through verses 1 through 17. We're going to go verse by verse because chapter 8, so like we did one week in chapter 6, one week in chapter 7, we're going to spend three weeks in chapter 8 because of just the depth of what Paul is teaching. So today I'm going to go through the first 17 verses and give you seven truths that you can see in this passage. And what you'll see is that Paul builds. He gives us a truth and then he builds on it. He gives us a truth and then he builds on it. And so I encourage you, I always encourage you, take notes, write these things down because it will be beneficial to you. So here's where Paul begins in verse one. He says, there is therefore. So in light of the fact that we have this standard that we cannot meet because of the sin nature that we have, he goes, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So those who are in a relationship with Jesus, God is not condemning you. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. From the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So you'll need to understand this. When Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about the human condition. When he talks about the spirit, sometimes he's talking about our spirit, but if it's capitalized, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. I and mean, what he's talking about when he says spirit is the spiritual condition of man that has surrendered itself to God and is following God. So flesh is the sin nature, spirit is the spiritual nature. And Paul starts off by saying, God's not condemning you. So here's the first truth I want to give you. God didn't set us free so he could condemn us, but to lead us to a deeper life. All that God did that Paul just explained, God became man in the person of Jesus and took all of our sin upon his body and the death that we deserve, the shame that we deserve, the separation that we deserve, what I talk about every single week, Jesus did all of that for us, not so that he could go to the cross, die for our sins, be resurrected, and then turn around and go, see, you really are that bad. I did all of that because of how evil you are. Paul's like, friends, you need to understand the God who was in heaven, who looked down on the brokenness of humanity and whose thought was, I'm going to go down and save him after he saves us is not going to turn around and condemn us. He's not going to look at you and say, you're evil. You need to go away. You need to separate yourself. And, and I say this often, and I want it to really stink into your hearts. Each one of us have a running dialogue in our heads. We have that voice that talks to us. And at times, the voice that talks to us tells us we should have shame, we should have guilt, that we should pull back from God because of what we did that day, what we did that week, what we've done in this season, that we should wait until we get our lives together before we pursue God. Friends, I want to clearly tell you, that voice that tells you in any way to pull away from God, even for a moment, I promise you, that is not the voice of God in your life. What he is clearly saying is the voice of God in your life is never going to condemn you. God will convict you, and I, I have to teach this often, he will convict you, he will point out sin, but the difference between condemnation and conviction is condemnation points out your sin and pushes you away from God. Conviction points out your sin and pulls you into the Savior and says, this is broken, this is wrong, but I want to save this in your life. And so Paul goes, friends, he is not condemning you. He is not the voice that says, run away, separate yourself, feel shame, feel guilt. He is the voice that says, I loved you enough to die on the cross for your sins. Right. So this is the foundation. Then in verse four, Paul continues and says, so all that he did in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
Again, he's setting up the tension that we can walk in our human nature of the flesh toward destruction, or we can walk in the spirit toward life. And here's the second truth. Our calling is to focus on the Holy Spirit and not look back. If you can just use the mental image that I keep giving you in this series of focusing ourselves on Jesus and not on our past, this is what he's calling us to. He saved us out of the brokenness of sin, and he set us on a pathway. And the pathway that he set us on is one that leads toward life. See, salvation was not the end story. God didn't save us and then transform us into the perfect person. He saved us and invited us on a journey of sanctification. That's a fancy word to say, to be made holy. That he invited us to walk with him on this pathway toward life. But our responsibility is not to look back. Not to look back on our sin and our shame. Which oftentimes becomes the filter through which we view Jesus. Is that we look back and we go, oh, but I, I was so bad. And when I say our past, I want us to understand what I mean by that. I'm not talking about our distant past. I'm talking about, I mean, you know this, right? Every moment, a moment later is your past, right? So if you right now do something evil, like if you're thinking an evil thought about me right now, (laughs) it's in your past. You can confess that sin. All right, sorry. That that sounded funnier in my head. But anyway, in in that moment, that is your past. What God says is we don't look back in our past. We look forward toward Jesus And the only time it's good to look back in our past is to be reminded of how generous God's grace is in our life. We look back and go, man, I really was awful, but his grace was sufficient. His grace saved, and so I'm going to walk forward. But we also don't look back on our life and think that somehow it's better than the life that Jesus offers. And sometimes we do that. Oh, do you remember when we could party? Do you remember when we could live this way or that way? What Paul is declaring is to understand That is of the flesh and it leads to death. Any draw that you have toward your old life is a draw toward a lie, an illusion of life. And so he's saying we need to walk and put our attention on the Holy Spirit, put our attention on God, and this is how he's going to guide us. Paul goes on in verse 5 and says for those, now now this is going to get really uh, personal and deep here in a moment, so just kind of prepare yourself. He says for those who live According to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So here's the third truth. Who or what you focus on determines your destination. So Paul's just making a kind of a blanket statement. He says, basically can go in either order, but those who set their, themselves to live according to the flesh are going to think about the things of the flesh and those who are going to live according to the spirit set their minds on the spirit but he could say it another way he could say if you set your mind on the spirit you'll live that way if you set your mind on the flesh you'll live that way but he's saying there, there there's these two choices and what he's saying is who or what that you focus on determines your destination now i'm going to explain something very personal as a pastor and, and when i say this i want to i want to prep you so that you can understand It's going to be very easy that as I start to talk about this, this might come across as that I'm using my platform to throw shade at someone. I promise you I'm not. I really wrestled with this because I don't ever want to give that image. But as a pastor, at times, I have to wade into the murkiness of our culture to address things from a biblical perspective. And so there's some risk to that. All I would simply ask you is to give me grace to to explain what it is I'm trying to say. Does that sound fair? Okay. Really, no matter how you respond, I'm still going forward. So let's do it, right? Here's one of the things I recognized in the last year and a half, that I was having a very difficult time having conversations with different individuals and different people groups, and I could not understand the tension. So I would say something, I would post something, I would engage a topic, and people's response would be like, their emotion would not match what I think just happened. And so at times it would be like confusing and angry and and I got frustrated and I would get insecure and then sometimes my feelings would get hurt and then I would feel like I have to defend myself and then it would just create this turmoil and then everyone that loves me wants to defend me and everyone that liked the other person's opinion wants to defend them. And, And I was like, I don't understand what's going on. Did I just explain everyone else's situation too? Like, I would just look at it and think, like, I don't get this because I'm not sure what's going on. And then I realized it's because we're not speaking the same language. And, and what I mean by that is we have such a different value system at times 
that when we try to engage a topic, we're coming at it from such different angles, we're not speaking the same language. Now, I'm going to give you a really silly example of something that happened to me like a decade ago, just to kind of illustrate this. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was on a plane, and I had the aisle seat, and next to me was a, a woman that was, was older than me, and then her husband. And she was reading a magazine, if my memory serves me right, it was like Popular Science or Popular Mechanics, one of those types of magazines. And in the article, it was talking about the exploration of the moon and the desire to go back, and it was talking about some of the cost of it. And so this lady engaging me says, I'm just so sick and tired of all the money that we're spending going to the moon. And her husband is next to her, and he nods his head, he's like, mm-hmm. And she goes, this is what I think they should do. If they want to study the moon, they should put rockets on it and bring it to earth. And her husband was like, that's a good idea. And I was like sitting there and I was like, Phew. like, I don't even know how to engage this, right? Like we're not speaking the same language. Like I was like, okay, what do I start? Where do I start? Let me start with this. That would be the largest asteroid to ever hit Earth. That'd be a global extinction event. Every man, woman, and child would die. So I start there and I was like, well, no. Then I was like, maybe I could talk to, like, that's illogical. You know how big the rockets would have to be? And I was like, no. Then I was like, maybe just start simple. Like, that would mess up our, the tides of the ocean. And then I was like, you know what? We're not speaking the same language. I was like, that's a good idea. That's really good. You guys get what I'm saying, though? Like, not the same language, not the same conversation, okay? So again, hear me, I'm, I'm, I'm making light. But in the everyday world, I realized that people have such a different value system at times that we're not speaking the same language. So I would address something from a biblical perspective and people would get fired up. And I realized it's because my number one value system, and I don't say this to lift myself up, it's just who God has made me to be now. My number one value system is to honor God. And, and I'm not exaggerating. This is the passion of my mind and life. I think about this concept every single day, all day long. And I'm not exaggerating. Every situation that I face, good and bad, it immediately goes through my brain. What does God want me to do in this situation? I'll give you a couple quick examples. So my wife's out of town right now. And when my wife's out of town, that basically means me and my kids eat out <laughs> because I'm just not great at cooking. And, uh, and so yesterday, my, two, my, uh, my daughter was with Mary. So my two oldest sons were at different events. Uh, with family and friends. And so I had my son Lincoln. So we go to a Mexican restaurant here in town that I go to all the time and, and always have incredible service, except yesterday. Uh, I mean, it was just bad from the very beginning. They sat us at a table that obviously hadn't been cleaned. It took forever to get our drink order. Didn't bring us out chips and salsa, which is like the cardinal sin, right? I mean, we all can agree on that. And then it was like, took forever to get our order and then forever to clean our table, forever to get, like didn't give us refills, which is like the second no-no for me. And then like, it was just like this whole bad experience. So they bring the bill finally and I was paying it and I had immediately the moment in my mind was like, my tip is gonna reflect this moment. And then as quickly as I thought that, my brain was like, no, it's not. <laughs> because this is another spiritual moment. I'm gonna still tip generously like I always do because there's a greater value than me expressing my displeasure that they messed up one time, right? And so again, I'm not saying to lift myself up, I'm saying like, that's my perspective. I'll tell you another one too, this, you, you just gotta kind of, uh, I need you to feel my pain, okay? <laughs> so last night we go to another place and we're a fast food place, we're getting a, a sub and we're pulling out. As we pull into order, this, this person that I see that always works there is outside having a smoke, but still has their headset on. And I thought, this person's gonna take my order outside. Like I can just sense it. So I pull up and I, they're like, can I help you? And I can hear this person's voice. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. So I have, my two sons are with me now. I place three orders, right? My order and every single sub that we order is specialized. Know this, extra this, light on this. And this person's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, and I want it so bad just to turn around, make eye contact with, and go like, you're not writing this down, and I know it. So then this person has me repeat the order because they're finishing their cigarette. And at this point, I'm like about to put it in park. You know what I mean? Like those emotions. And I was like, all right. So I just repeat my order. And, and Lincoln, you can attest how true this is. And, and so I repeat it, and this person's like, okay, let's see if he got it. And I'm like, who's he? And so then this guy voice comes on. He didn't get it. So I had to repeat my order a third time. And, and so like, as we're pulling up, I'm like, I'm just gonna say to them, you know, that would have been easier if you would have just finished your cigarette before you took my, like, I'm thinking like, oh, I got a good comeback, you know, pull up to the window, you know what I did? Gave him my money and said, thank you. Took my stuff and went, right? Cause I could have had that moment of like, here, you know, and I could have been justified. 
That's how I hear it, right? That's how we sound. But I was like, you know what? There's a bigger moment. And the reason why I say that again, you just trust my heart on this. I'm not saying to lift myself up. I'm saying this is my perspective from years of failure and failure because the old Matthew would have told him off. The old Matthew would have left a lesser tip. God has led, him, led me to this point. So the reason I say that is I'm having conversations with people that I realize that's not their value system, that they've placed something else ahead. And so I'll have conversations with people where they come to me as a pastor and they'll say, what do I have to do to remain in relationship with God? And do I have to serve like this? Do I have to give like this? And do I have to do this? And I realize the questions that they're asking are what's the bare minimum required in order to stay in a relationship with God so I don't lose out on heaven. And for me, in my perspective, I'm not asking that question. I'm asking the question, what can I do to receive more of the fullness of the life that God offers? And so when we have these two different conversations, there's going to be tension. And so when I address political issues and I address social issues, I'm not thinking of it through a political lens. I'm not thinking about it from an American lens. I'm not thinking about it from a selfish lens. I'm thinking about it from what does the word of God say about this topic? And so when people get fired up and they get angry about it, I realize, oh, it's because we don't have the same value system. And the reason why I'm saying that is not to throw shade at someone, but to explain that will be the tension in every person's life that's trying to follow God without fully submitting to the Holy Spirit. That God will call you to do something and you will have a violent reaction to it emotionally and mentally and spiritually because it goes against your flesh. Your flesh wants to go this way, God wants you to go this way, and there is that battle. And so what Paul is explaining is who or whatever you focus on is going to determine where you ultimately end up. And then he goes on and explains that this gets even deeper. He says this in verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind, now, now get this, I mean, this is sobering what Paul is saying here, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not, does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's the next truth. There are only two destinations. There's two destinations. And so when we have this tension for us as a church, and this isn't unique to me, every single pastor friend of mine has dealt with the same thing the last year, year and a half. As a church, when we're trying to say, guys, look at Jesus, look at the Holy Spirit, what does, what does the Bible tell us to do? It's because we realize there's only one way that leads to life. And hear me, there's only one way that pleases God. There's only one way that's not hostile to God. Every other way is leading toward destruction. Every other way is hostile to the kingdom of God. And so often, even as Christians, we can put the number one priority as politics. We can put the number one priority as American rights. We can put the number one priority as selfish desire or human rights or self-protection. We can put the number one desire as our families, our family time. We can put the number one desire as a form of, of economic systems. And we say, this is what my number one thing is. But just note, if the number one thing in your life is not submission to the Holy Spirit, you will always be living in a way that is hostile toward the kingdom of God. And this is what Paul is explaining. Hear me, friends, not to shame, not to guilt, but to challenge so that you can repent and turn and experience a deeper life. And so when we look at this, we have to wrestle with it. How do we respond when we are walking in hostility to God and truth is exposed to us? Wrestle with that. Write that down. How do you respond when you're walking a certain way and maybe you don't even realize it's in hostility to God and yet truth is placed in front of you and you realize you're walking the wrong direction. Do you fight it? Do you repent? Do you turn? So yesterday, I posted a video. And the video was about the concept of wearing masks right now in light of the release, the restrictions for those who have been vaccinated. And here's what the video was not. It was not me giving you an opinion about vaccination. It was not me giving an opinion about should we wear masks or not masks based on the health things and all that. I wasn't giving an opinion about vaccinations. I wasn't giving an opinion about masks. What I was giving an opinion about is for those who would use 
the release that we don't have to wear masks if you're vaccinated as a way to lie and say they have been vaccinated so they don't have to wear a mask. What I was addressing was a character issue, uh, an honesty issue, and again, not from a political perspective or an American perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Is everyone tracking with me? So like I was just posting this video saying like, guys, don't, because you want to quit wearing masks, don't use that as, a, as an opportunity to be dishonest. Like integrity is so much more important than that moment. And a, and a gentleman in our church, a young adult, and uh, actually was in uh, the youth ministry when I was still a part of it here at the church, Jacob White, I, I share this with his permission. He wrote a post as he shared my video, and it so touched my heart because what I saw is a man of God who was wrestling with his character and made the correct choice. So this is what he wrote. I'm just reading it word for word. He said, this is a moment of honesty for me. This morning, I was Googling fake vaccine cards so that I wouldn't be harassed about not wearing a mask. Some of you are like, ooh, done that. He says, as a veteran, someone who took action to protect our liberties and a strong believer in personal liberties, I see them as an unnecessary encroachment on my rights. Then my pastor randomly posted this video and I felt God's conviction to be obedient. I know many of you will personally disagree with what's being said here like I want to. The difference between that thinking and this is having a biblical worldview where you follow the word over your own desires. It's difficult and it takes humility and I struggle with doing it just like everyone else. But in this scenario, I will continue to follow scripture. I'm going to keep my mask on until I decide that a vaccination is right for me or masks are no longer required. And then I love his response. He says, please take any questions to the following. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, or Romans 13. And then he says, any further questions can go to my inbox. <laughs> Do you see what Jacob was dealing with? There's that tension inside his spirit. Man, I've been there. Have you been there? I, I, want, you, I want to acknowledge something that I think you probably already know. I can post at times in social media the right thing to do. I am never saying it's easy. Not for me, I'm saying. I'm saying there are times, uh, okay, I'll make a confession. I hate wearing masks and I have the entire time, okay? Like, I hate it. So some people think like, oh, man, it's just like so pro-mask. I'm not, but I'm pro-God. I'm pro-trusting and submission to God. I know some of you just hate that statement that I just made. It's just who I am because every other pathway that I've tried in my life has let me down. The pathway of trust and submission to God has never let me down. And this is what Jacob wrestled with. And his response, I love it, is he says, first go to the scripture. And then if you have any other questions or comments, then engage me because his perspective is a biblical worldview. Let's start with the scriptures and let's make a transition from there. And so Paul goes on and says in verse nine, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, this is weird language, but what Paul is saying, where it says, if in fact, another way to word that is since the spirit lies in you. So almost every single person agrees that Paul was not saying there's a possibility to be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. He was speaking in, in a dramatic way, but there's the assumption the Holy Spirit's a part of you if you're saved. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And then in one of the most exciting verses in the scriptures, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Can you get excited over that? The same Holy Spirit who resurrected Jesus after he'd been crucified is the same Holy Spirit who lives inside the life of a believer. Truth number five, Christians have the Holy Spirit in them. And you need to understand what this means. There's two parts to it. The first, it means relationship. The Spirit of God is inside you in relationship. He's engaging you. He's convicting you. He's empowering you. He's comforting you. He's guiding you into all truth. He's teaching you new things. He's allowing, he's shaping you to produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. He, he's producing his gifts through your life to minister to other people. The Holy Spirit is everything. And this is what Paul is saying. So the first part is relationship, but when you have relationship with God, you also receive power. They go hand in hand, relationship and power. And I want you to know this. I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, but the story of redemption, the ultimate goal was the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
When, when God, in the moment in the garden when humanity sinned, God began a plan of redemption, and God knew exactly how that plan would end. And in the moment of our sin, God knew that he would create something better, that at someday he wouldn't just physically be with humanity, but he would be inside of every single believer. So God launched this plan, and he wanted people to know it was always his plan. So when he delivered uh, the Israelites out of Egypt and they had been in slavery for 400 years. They didn't know God. They knew of God, but they didn't know God. And God delivers them. And how did he deliver them? With the Passover. He sent nine plagues and this over and over punished Egypt. And then the 10th plague. This is what God said to them. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the blood of a spotless lamb so a young lamb that doesn't have any blemish on it, I want you to kill it, take the blood, and apply it to your doorpost. Put it on the top of your doorpost, put it on the sides of your doorpost. And what this signified is you were applying the blood of the spotless lamb to your home, to your life, everyone who lives in that home. And God said, on this specific day, I'm going to come. And what I'm going to look for is the blood of the spotless lamb applied to your home, the door. And if I see the blood of the spotless lamb, I'm going to pass over. But if I don't see the blood of the spotless lamb applied, I'm going to kill the firstborn, both of person and of animal, of that home. So what God's warning is, you don't have to experience death. But if you want to experience life, you have to apply the blood of the spotless lamb to your home. And so the Israelites all did this. And in the moment where God came and he did this, and he took the life of everyone who disobeyed, what the blood of the spotless lamb provided was three things. It first brought life. They did not die. But second, it brought freedom. It was that plague that broke the spirit of Pharaoh. He let them go, and they experienced freedom to be removed from slavery. But the third thing it brought was relationship with God. Because up until that point, they had heard of God, but now they were going to walk in relationship with God. And so God told them, the Passover is a celebration you're going to celebrate every single year going forward, an eternal celebration that you're going to have. But then 50 days after Passover, God led the nation of Israel to Mount Sinai. And on this day, God lowered himself in the sense that his presence descended upon the mountain. And his presence from that day forward was an introduction to the people of Israel. And on this day, he gave them both the law of God, the commandments of God, but he also gave them his presence, that he was introducing himself to them. They saw the power of God. They heard his voice speak. It was terrifying to them, the power that he showed. But they introduced and met God on the day of Pentecost. So Passover, 50 days later, Pentecost, the presence of God. And God told them to celebrate these feasts, these celebrations, every single year. So for 1,500 years, as they were able, unless they were in captivity, but even there they could celebrate, for 1,500 years... They would celebrate the Passover, the applying of the, the blood of the spotless lamb that brought life, that brought freedom, that brought relationship with God. And then 50 days later, they would celebrate the feast. And they call it different names, Feast of Harvest, Feast of Weeks. But it was the Pentecost feast. And they celebrated this for 1,500 years. Okay. Then Jesus came. And when was Jesus crucified? On what day? Passover. Do you remember when John the Baptist, the prophet, who was preparing the way for Jesus, when he saw Jesus walk, and he had never met him prior to this, even though they were cousins, they had never met, John looked up, pointed at Jesus, and said to the crowd, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that Jesus would be the spotless Lamb, and he would shed his blood, and he would die on the cross for sins, and he would be resurrected. And when we apply the blood of the spotless Lamb that was provided on Passover, we experience life. Our sins are forgiven. We are restored in relationship with God. We experience to be set free from the bondage of sin and the slavery to sin. But we also are introduced into a relationship with God. But do you know what also happened? Jesus was crucified on Passover. 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus had already ascended into heaven, God sent the promise of his Holy Spirit to fill the life of the believers. And on that 50th day, all of the disciples were praying together and the Holy Spirit descended and filled them and it changed everything in their life. 
And what they experience is now not just, they didn't just have the laws of God, but now they had the very presence of God to empower them to live differently. This was always the plan of God, to bring freedom, to bring relationship, but to give us the power we need to be successful. Is everyone tracking with this? This was the heart of God from the very beginning. And so when we look at this truth of what Paul is saying, he goes, guys, you have this battle in front of you, the battle of the flesh, the battle of the spirit, but know this, the very spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit who lives inside of you that's gonna empower you to walk toward truth if you will submit, if you will allow that power to reign in your life. And so then Paul goes on and says in verse 12, and this is really the question, so what should our response be? This is our response, verse 12. So then, so it's like saying, therefore, in light of, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let me say that again. But if by the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit inside of you, by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So here's truth six. Put to death by living in both obedience to and power of the Holy Spirit. So here's a question. What comes first? Obedience or power? Power or obedience? What comes first? Here's the answer. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. What I mean by that? Does the Holy Spirit lead us to truth? Yes. Does he empower us to truth? Yes. But we have to also take steps of faith and obedience. So sometimes it's obedience that comes first and then the power follows. Have you had that moment? You're terrified. God calls you to do something. You're like, oh man, I just can't see how this is gonna work out. And you don't feel very powerful, but you take that step of faith and then God meets you there. And then there are other times where God lays out something in front of you that you know you would never take on your own, but yet you just feel secure. Your faith is strong and you take it in confidence and then God meets you there. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other because God is perfectly guiding our lives for what we need in that moment. And when we look at the scriptures, there was this constant tension of obedience and faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. But what God said is just trust me and obey and I promise you I'll meet you there. So with the nation of Israel, he would at times command them, go out to battle and I'll meet you there. But they had to go out to battle. And sometimes he fought for them. They didn't even have to fight. Other times he empowered them and they fought and they were victorious. King David, before he was a king, he takes on a giant. But what did he have to do? He had to charge the giant first. He went running after him with the sling and then God guided the stone and gave him the victory. All of the prophets who had the fear that they had to speak to men in power who were wicked and evil, they had to speak the words and then God took those words and did supernatural things through them. The apostles, I mean, even Peter on the day of Pentecost when he first experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. This is Peter who 50 days prior to this was denying Jesus to anyone who asked because he was a man of fear. On the day of Pentecost in front of thousands of his own countrymen, got up and told them they're all murderers that they murdered the Son of God. He challenged them, and on that day, 3,000 men were saved. That represented 3,000 households, possibly 10,000, 15,000 people in that moment were saved. Why? Because Peter felt the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He spoke in obedience, and the Holy Spirit met him there and changed people's lives. And sometimes it turns out exactly how we would script it, other times differently. Stephen has this moment where he's confronted by the mob. He looks at them. He realizes they're gonna kill him. So what happens? The Holy Spirit empowers him. He preaches one of the most convicting sermons you could ever hear and read, and they stone him to death. But before he died, he looked up and heaven opened up and he saw heaven. And the Holy Spirit confirmed to him where he was about to go. And he was killed, but he was empowered by the Spirit to do that. And reading Hebrews chapter 11, there were men and women who were faithful and God protected them and guided them. There were men and women who were faithful and God allowed them to die because sometimes God's plan is different, but God's promise is that he will be with his people. God's promise is that we were ultimately, for those who hold faithful, will ultimately experience heaven with God. And so this is Paul's challenge. He's saying, guys, you have to put yourself to death by trusting in the Holy Spirit by walking in power and obedience, by making him the priority. 
And then here's the last truth that I'll give you. In verse 15 through 17, he says, and this is so peaceful. This is so comforting. At least I hope it is. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit, Holy Spirit, of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And that term Abba is a relational way of saying father. It'd be comparable in our culture of saying dad or daddy. But he's saying we have the ability to be in a personal relationship with God, a loving, even affectionate relationship. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hear that. God wants to confirm in your heart that you're his child. That you're his child and comfortable enough to approach him and call him dad to be in that type of relationship. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ so that we're gonna receive the inheritance that God has for us, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Here's the last truth I'll give you. Embrace your adoption. Hear me, God chose you. That's the beauty of this concept of adoption. God chose you. He didn't just have a child and see how it turned out. He saw you and me in all of our brokenness and all of our sin, and he chose us. He knew exactly what he was getting into, and he said, you're my child. If you will receive this gift, and we receive it by faith, and we become his children. And why does that matter? Why is that more than just an affectionate statement that I want to throw out? Because when you really do have the conviction that you are a child of God, here's what you know. He's gonna lead you in the right direction, right? If he's your father and he's God and he's loving, he's gonna lead you in the right direction. But you also know in that process, he's gonna provide for you every single thing that you need. But it's your choice. Will you surrender to the leadership of his spirit in your life or will you fight against it and head toward flesh? See, friends, my, my last encouragement that I would give to you is to view this step of following and obedience, to view this as an invitation to know God better and to feel his love deeper. Not an invitation of all that I have to give up and all that I have to surrender, but to say, okay, I realize he's leading me somewhere better, somewhere deeper. And this is the heart of God and it's always been the heart of God. In John chapter three, if you can just let me read it to you, Jesus is having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus and here's what he says to him. Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and that's natural birth, and the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he goes on and says, so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And then in the, the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Can you see the parallels with Romans 8? He didn't send him into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And then note what it says here. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may clearly be seen that his works have been carried out in God. What Jesus says is he wants everyone to be saved, but you have to be willing to step into the light and say, God, show me what needs to change. Holy Spirit, show me. And when the Holy Spirit shows you, when you're walking in flesh and the Holy Spirit shows you, your response has to be to turn and to walk into obedience. So friends, I say this often to you. I believe for some of you, the truth that you have to embrace is the truth of God's grace that God is telling you, you gotta, you gotta accept it and surrender that. For some of you, I believe God has given you something specific he wants you to do. Today is the day to walk in obedience. That choice is yours. Will you submit to his spirit in your life? Will you bow your heads? God, what a marvelous thing it is 
that you love us the way that you do. That even though we are broken and rebellious at times, it doesn't put you off, you don't give up, but instead you continue to meet us on the pathway of the flesh and you challenge us to turn. So here's what I ask, help us to trust your Holy Spirit, help us to surrender to your Holy Spirit. And as we do that, help us to see the power changing us from the inside out. Lord, we give you all the glory and we pray this in your precious name, amen.